uh, you know, most people here, I think, in Columbus know who doesn't know Ken. <laughs> right. All right. A few of them. There's a few people there. So, you know, Ken has actually been participating in this conference since the beginning four years ago. Uh, and when I reached out to him to explain what we were doing in the Columbus market, what we're trying to do to improve uh, our companies and improve our software development and uh, the experience of our users, uh, you know, he re it resonated with him and he has helped build uh, this conference from the beginning. And it's just really, really nice to continue to have him back uh, and to hear from him and see how not only we're maturing uh, as a community, but also what he's seen out in the market uh, from a maturity perspective and sort of what's next. So uh, without anything further, Ken Schwaber. What attracts me to here is the passion of Bart and everyone in Columbus. I'm always attracted to places with passion. Um, that he and Koha can pull off a conference of 800 some people when it started with 120. Um, I think he's crazy, you know, but that's another thing. Um, I actually have an announcement before the presentation. Um, a joyous moment. My youngest and last daughter is getting married this Saturday in Baltimore, Ohio. And so I can't think of a better thing to have happen. So I'm here to make sure my future son-in-law stays. Right? <laughs> so I, had, I really don't have um, a specific thing I want to talk to you about. Um, more some ideas that I think may, might be helpful. Um, one idea that I did want to share with you is a new version of the Scrum Guide from Jeff and myself is coming out um, July 4th, Independence Day. Europe, they don't know what that is, but here we do. So things I want to cover is agility is important. I heard Andy Hunt took, tore that to shreds this morning, so that was good. Um, Scrum has improved software development, it seems, or that's my impression, that's my opinion. Um, Scrum is foundational to agility. If you can't rapidly turn over and create new increments of software that you could potentially use, being agile is a dream. Um, managers and organizations certainly want and need to be agile in today's competitive market. But many managers don't know their roles in Scrum, nor in creating an agile organization. This is a new thing. So these are just the topics that I want to talk about. First of all, agility. These are dictionary type stuff. So in enterprises, this is from an enterprise or organization's point of view, their ability to take advantage of opportunities, that's a good thing, respond to challenges while controlling risk. So you can see the part that Scrum would play into that. But there are a lot of business practices that have to be there as part of that. Just having software development that does it is insufficient. Um, also just you know, much more simple, to be quick, to be nimble. These are quotes from The Economist, a pretty, pretty business or um, mainstream type of publication from 2010. And this, this is in the middle of the financial meltdown. And they quote, interviewed a whole number of CEOs. And they said, um, volatility is likely to remain a constant. It will continue to roil traditional business and operating models for some time to come. And they talked, of course, about internationalization. They talked about monetary changes. They talked about workforce um, globalization. They talked about the new types of technologies, material management, and things that are coming out. I mean, the, the change and the opportunity and the risk is phenomenal. And so that what their assertion was, was to remain competitive, companies must respond quickly and nimbly, that word sounds familiar, to a changing environment. Their ability to respond to market movement is core to their sustainability. Sustainability is another word for survival. So this is not, hey, maybe we'll adopt this or maybe not. This is kind of an important thing. And then they did a, a survey from, again, all the CEOs. And 40% um, of them said that this was absolutely important. It is a core differentiator for them. So if they couldn't be agile, this would not be a good thing for them. Um, another 48%, not quite as severe, but it's somewhat important. It contributes to our business success. 
I'm not sure if they're going to put their shoulder to the wheel, but they recognize it's um, one of the areas. And then there were a bunch of other people who woke up and said, huh, what, huh? But um, so 40%, oh, we have to do this or we're toast. 48%, pretty important to us. This is from um, the chaos report from the Stanish group in, in um, Boston area. And this was, um, they used to report on, they still report on projects, IT projects and the success and failure and problems that they have. And about 2010, they started differentiating their reporting on projects which they called agile, which really for, to them means iterative incremental, um, and waterfall. And they started noticing that the, when you track the ones that they called agile, they were three times more successful than the ones that were waterfall. Now successful is interesting. Um, the criteria they use for success came out of, of um, the waterfall world, which is you state all the requirements up front and you deliver all of them on the date that you predict for the cost that you budgeted. Now that's not necessarily agile, so I would consider a project where we deliver only 40% of the requirements that were critical and add 20% more, which give us competitive advantage for half the cost on one quarter of the date to be radically um, successful and useful. They wouldn't have included, they would call that a challenged project given those criteria. We would probably consider that you know, wildly successful. So just a, a, a question. How does your management know if your organization is becoming more agile? And can you spend, I mean, I, Maybe you're sitting with strangers, I don't know. Can you spend a few minutes talking with the people around you, you know, like pondering? Because I'm sure, you know, you talk to managers and they always want to be agile because they've seen it in the press. Um, how would your management know if you're becoming more agile? This is an exercise for you. Go to it. This is a break for me. Okay, this would be a, a long-term one. Does anyone in the balcony have an idea? Talk for your group. Got to measure. Measure these parts. Got to measure what? Whatever it is you're trying to figure out. <laughs> so we could measure something that we think is important to our organization to be competitive and measure that. Are we able to show to management and business owners, whoever management is, yeah. um, working in software, you know, changes, features, things you've added every three, four, six weeks versus every six months? So that would be interesting, but that would be good in the software world. But if I'm a manager, I'm, or let's say a CEO, I'm probably looking more broadly. And so someone says, hey, we need to be agile. I'm like, are we agile? Hmm. Anyone over there? Yes. Yeah, uh, you, you came up with just uh, organization delivering more value more frequently. Organization delivering more value more frequently. Um, person in the blue shirt. Yeah, you. Me? Yep. <laughs> I'll say like uh, having more visibility into what's being done. More visibility into what's being done in the market or in your organization? In the organization. Okay. Person in the yellow shirt. Me? Yep. <laughs> I didn't raise my hand, but that's okay. Yep. Um, I know. <laughs> the responsiveness, like in fulfilling a request. A request, a request is made of the business, and how quickly did we deliver? How quickly did we respond? So the, the senior management at Motorola, when they were still selling the Razor phone and the iPhone came out and they couldn't respond, could have deduced that they were short in agility or something. But you know, this is interesting because if it's all a buzz and it's, it's maybe even faddish or it's a word that's used to des describe um, an enterprise capability that's critical, 
I mean, it'd be really good to know what it is. And the ideas are, are as Andy did in his keynote, um, all over the place. So most, or, most organizations have an agile initiative. Um, for better or worse, you know, someone at the top has said, we're going to be more agile. I read a magazine yesterday and said we should be agile, we're going to be more agile. Um, so, so question, just in, in um, your organization, your um, department, your part of the company, how much money has been invested in agility per person? How many um, think are, it's like less than $1,000? How many, like, less than, between 1,000 and 10,000? 10,000, 100,000? Over 100,000? How many haven't the vaguest idea? You know, there's been some money flowing through somehow, but, okay, so just a, a thought. Um, what's been the return on investment of, of this money that was spent? How many think it's been less than zero? More than zero? Haven't the vaguest idea? Hmm. Interesting, because one of the jobs of managers is to manage um, the resources, which includes money they spend, to create value for their organization. Hmm. So this should be a pretty well-known thing. Um, has, has your organization's agility with these two things happening gone up? Um, down, stay the same, don't know, hmm, interesting, and, and I'm not trying to, um, well actually I am, I'm trying to be provocative, we, we talk about these words, we come to conferences about this, we read articles, we, we have agile dances we do in the street and things like that, or in Boston, we do, not Columbus. Um, and, and yet, um, what is it? And, and we've heard from 40% of management CEOs that this is absolutely critical for their company. And they don't know what the ROI, you know, that should be really spread, or whether they're more or less agile. So, hmm. Starting to feel like those of you who are over 30 years old, if you remember TQM, Mm, there was a thing that didn't last very long. Now, if you, in your organization, always curious to know because, you know, we asked, just asked some questions, right? Who is responsible for creating or helping your organization become more agile? And what I'd like you to do is raise your hand if you think, um, it doesn't have to be this in a binary, you could be inclusive. Um, developers. Um, managers, executives. I'm getting a sense that, boy, if all of those aren't participating, not a good thing. Um, consultants, <laughs> buy your way into agility. This is good. I, I just identified the consultants in the audience. <laughs> Um, trainers. Um, hi, I'm going to train you to be thinner. Just stick around, right? Um, ah, new methodology. Not a lot of votes for that one. Okay, but, but these are you know just how are you going to you know we just looked at numbers spent on being agile, the ROI of it, the impact on your company. And, and it's always good to know who to go to and say, hey, how's it going? How's it happening? Why is it happening? What are you going to do over the next month, year to become more agile? Um, how much money are you going to spend? What's your investment going to be? How are you going to measure how much more agile you are? You, know, you certainly get the marketplace measurements like Motorola iPhone, um, but it's good not to wait until you get those types of you know, really black and white notices. This is an email I got. It's, it's not, unfortunately, uncommon. 
and, and it's from someone who's manager way up at the top, has, has told her to help the organization become agile. And I'm a member of a team that's investigating moving our development group to Scrum Agile model. At the moment, we're looking to get some on-site training for our developers, testers, managers, product owners. We're all over the world. I'm just saying this request for additional information signed a build and release engineer. Okay. I don't know how she's gonna make their organization agile. The, the leverage is just real weak. And so you, you see something which, which people said 48% was really, really important to their company. Um, somehow this initiative has been passed down the chain to someone who apparently wasn't looking the right way at the right time and got nailed with this assignment. And I get calls and people say, hey, can you come in? You know, we're on the way to become Agile and we need someone to teach us Scrum. I'm like, that won't make you Agile, you know. Might make me have to travel, but you know, it's not gonna make you Agile. It's gonna be a training course. And so there's a lot of confusion about what does this? You know, how do you gain this competitive advantage? Because agility isn't necessarily about getting Scrum training. That's about you know, trainers making money and you sitting somewhere for two days and being uncomfortable. Or if it's a good trainer, they'll entertain you. That's good. So path to agility. You know, you're, you're moving forward. You're, you're going to become more agile. You were the release engineer. You got um, this. By the way, when I first did that presentation, this really, really nice lady came up and said, I'm the person who sent that to you. And I'm like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> She said, and I know what you're talking about because I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you think your organization's agile. I'm becoming agile. I um, have been told this, that we're gonna be agile um, and are soon gonna start it, but you know, not a lot of evidence yet. It's good. Um, not in your immediate horizon. It's a, it's a good thing to know, it, and it isn't necessarily critical. Um, if I were in some industries, it might not be very important. If I were in other industries, it would be, you know, like if I were building apps for um, phones and for mobile devices, it'd probably be really important. If I were in a bank, it probably didn't used to be very important until people started to be able to withdraw funds on their um, watch. Now what we found, this is a Forrester um, survey. Forrester is a big research consulting company. Um, they found that almost 20% of all the people surveyed said that they were 100% agile. I hate to tell you, you did not reflect that. You reflected something more like four or five, three, four percent, but different survey. And, and then they had different ratios of, of being agile um, 75 to 99%, 12.2, 50 to 74, 12.7, under 25%, 40%. Now what's fascinating, a couple of fascinating things about these numbers is you have to know what agility is to say you're 100% agile. And we just went through some struggling about, you know, how do you measure it, how do you invest in it, why do you track your investment? Without that, it's tough to know. But, you know, surveys are surveys. And what they also came up with was 68.4% um, of those who said they were 100% agile were software vendors. You know, they were people who make money selling software embedded or packaged software, cloud software, and the rest were IT organizations. So um, more people who build software to sell felt like they should be 100% agile than those who were um, internal service organizations. Not, not unexpected. At, at the past um, half year, I've just accumulated some weird statistics to relate to this. Um, one was, I, I interviewed and surveyed a bunch of people in groups like this. Um, how many people were using TDD, test driven development, ATDD or BDD in their organization or team? 2%. That's less than the 20% who say they're 100% agile. 
huh, interesting. Um, how many of them use a source code management system? 18% don't. You thought the 5086 Hollerith card was dead. Apparently not. People still store source code in it. How can you be agile if you don't have source code management system? Um, just some thoughts. Um, how many people believe that self-organization works? 1%. And this, this was at an ALM conference held in Microsoft with about 500 of, of the best technical people that um, we could find in the area. These are really responsible, serious people. Three people out of the whole bunch of them thought that self-organization was a viable concept. That basically you are so dumb that I have to tell you what to do or you're going to screw it up. So all these numbers have, have certainly, um, it's like a mirror being held up to the 20% who say they're agile. So what we're getting into is numbers are some pretty interesting things when you start looking at them. So, so the question then is, um, how do we get agile? And a number of the definitions you gave, certainly valid. The one I, I gave earlier and that came from The Economist, the ability to be responsive to opportunities, to be able to um, survive in a meaningful, maybe even a better way, challenges, and to control risk at the same time. That would be a good definition of agility. And how do you measure that? How do you increase it? And what we've been seeing is there are two um, paths that seem to be emerging um, toward becoming agile. And um, one is you can buy it and you can install it. And we've seen two primary variants of this. One is um, the older version, which is RUP. And um, the other one was, is the newer version, um, SAFE, Scaled Agile Framework. Both of those are purchasable, and they've got all the parts laid out, like a waterfall methodology, and all you have to do is install it, train people to do their parts, and you put it on. And suddenly, you're agile. It's good. Um, the other way, kind of an old-fashioned way, is you earn it. Ah, that sucks. <laughs> and and um, that's what I'm going to talk to you today, today about is um, just within your organization, how you might look at the earning it approach. And what I'm also suspecting um, is that if you take those two groups that say it's important for us to be agile, the ones who are gonna buy their way into agility or being able to use the word of agile um, are those who said, the 48% who said, it's, it's important to us. Yep, right up there with something else. And um, the 40 person who said, who said it's an extremely important, it's a key differentiator to our survival, are the ones who are going to realize that this is a serious thing they have to acquire through work. It's like my disappointment when I am um, having a little trouble fitting my pants and saw on TV that I could buy a pill that would reduce my weight phenomenally. Just buy it. Didn't work. Had to exercise, dying, all that. Um, this is um, what the scaled agile framework approach, you know, very um, methodolo methodolo methodological, method. Oh, wait, shoot. That's, that's rough. I'm sorry, mistake. This is scaled agile framework. And what people love about this is you can see where you fit, you can see where all the agile artifacts that you've ever heard of. Um, including things like epics fit and how things roll down and ideas roll around. And this is really neat. You can train everyone in every part of it and then you are agile. That's good. Um, I have a slightly different take on that. Um, I was one of those people who wrote the Agile Manifesto. And, and that was a statement of value. And we said, we actually value individuals and their interactions over processes and tools. Is we want to see people think their way and earn and work their way into the best thing that can happen rather than have someone else or some tool which has some formula, um, a methodology in it, tell them what to do. 
This has been um, loved um, kind of not really thought about a lot, but, but loved. And I just had some, some thoughts that I want to say about it. Um, because we're starting to see, and you heard Andy and you heard a couple of people during the conference um, talk about we're starting to see more people talk about the left side being valuable. It took us like six, seven years spreading the message. And people stopped saying, hey, we're using waterfall. And it seems to be really good. You know, why should we even bother with Scrum? So we don't, didn't hear that as much. So um, we're starting to hear more and more momentum about the left side. Um, worse, um, we're seeing people make a lot of money off um, misinterpretations of things that we meant on the left side. And they're making money with tools. When I wrote the very first book about Scrum, when Jeff and I presented our first paper in 95 in Uppsala, um, we called the product backlog a single prioritized list. We didn't mean that was all that you need to run a product. And yet people like, like version one and really started building tools. And that was all it had. And they, they would openly look at a business customer and say, that's a really important thing you need there to be able to reach your customers. We call those epics. And customers said, epics were when the Norsemen went to England, raped and pillaged. You know, we call it a capability of our, our service. You know, so you start seeing people make money off, off not only what was um, described by a bunch of us, but not necessarily a very good interpretation, which has started to twist the whole agile movement. And it has people saying, Oh, well, we, we're agile because version one's an agile tool, so if we use it, we're agile. Wrong, you're using version one. That doesn't make you agile. Um, so we've been seeing that. We're also starting to see major um, initiatives, methodologies like SAFE come up, which say um, it's not individuals and interactions. You can buy this. We've already thought it through. All the practices are there. If you use this, you will be agile doesn't necessarily say that you're an automotive company, you're a software company, you're an oil and gas company, you're different ages, you're different dynamics. This will make you agile. And that's pretty troubling. Um, and ALM tools. I mean, they had a conference, um, EclipseCon, about Eclipse um, ALM tools. Microsoft, IBM, HP, and um, some other vendor, and we try to get an estimate of how much money they, how big the market is for ALM tools. And they said about $7 billion. Wow. And yet people don't use TDD. People don't understand cyclomatic complexity. They don't refactor their code. And so we're like, why don't you instead spend $7 billion helping and holding training classes to help the professionals learn how to do this, rather than selling them tools that are just going to sit there and uh, make you money, but not going to help achieve these values that we have at all. Um, so it's a bit worrisome. I was, um, Andy, are you here? Andy Hunt? No, he had to leave. He had to leave. He was down in, in um, Newport News with me at a DOD conference called Incozy. And we had a table of some people from Software Engineering Institute, CMM people. And Andy, myself, and some other people are here. It was supposed to be a battle between those crushing um, CMM people and the Agilistas, right? And, and I think it was Mark, Mark Paul who said, hey, wait, wait, I don't think there's any argument here. We are both intending to do anything we can to improve the soft profession of software development. He said, we're just wondering over in our area how you guys are going to avoid the corruption of money. He said, because suddenly we had assessors, we had CMM1 templates, CMM2 templates, we had people, coal companies that made tons of money off this, and our intentions disappeared. And he said, so we had a great idea. Unfortunately, it was too great of an idea. And we're just kind of curious how you are planning on avoiding this. So Andy and I went out and got drunk and you know, didn't, didn't consider it much more because we thought it was going to go nowhere, so we wouldn't have to worry you know, about that sort of stuff. And yet we're starting to see that sort of money. 
I'm watching TV a while ago, and I see one of the companies that took a product backlog that um, I described, Kent Beck described in some of his earlier books, um, it's just a list of stories, and in, in the center of the den of immorality and thievery in our country, Wall Street, they were standing up and celebrating how much money they were making as they went public. I was like, well, something's off. Just a thought. Um, someone gave me, we were talking about this during Andy and myself, um, we, we really didn't pursue it, but this is for those of you, I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois, which is kind of a Bible belt town, fundamentalist. And um, so I was trained in the Bible. And I remember in Matthew, um, there was um, a discussion about Jesus, who is quick. And the only time he really showed a lot of emotion, um, anger, expelled money changers from the temple. And what he did is he called them a den of thieves who were using it for their commercial interests. And if you share the values of the Agile Manifesto, I think you have to really worry about the people who are perverting it to make money. Because those of us who wrote it, we just got together because we love software development. And we found that writing down what we value was an interesting exercise. We published it. Who would have guessed? A lot of people apparently love developing software and they said, we want to join. We said, join what? <laughs> um, but, so we put up a place where they could all put up their names too. Those values are very, very important. And they're what make our, our profession an interesting place to be. It make it a place that can be used by a company to be agile. And um, I, I guess someone yesterday was giving a talk and he said, every 10 years, um, we, we get a new fad. You know, so we had structured methods and we had object oriented and now it's agile. It reminded me of when I was at Intuit and a guy comes up to me and, and I think it was flattery, but I'm not sure. He said, well, you've been around a while. You know, that was a little dubious. He said, we here at Intuit, you know, we use Waterfall, we rolled our own, and then we bought in one from um, Ernst & Young. Tried using XP, didn't really scale to our needs, so we tried building our own version of what we thought Scrum might be. Now we're using Scrum. Um, so, you know, just your opinion, what do you think is going to come next? I said, well, it really doesn't matter. The point of this is how do we get so we can build the software society needs that meets the more complex applications that are gonna be using? And, and anything that perverts that is a bad thing. Anything that supports that, and, and those of us who are at the Agile um, Manifesto signing um, said that we thought those values were up there, is a good thing. Money corrupts. Gotta watch out. The other thing I thought was just important was to point out um, that um, the word agile in the Agile Manifesto was just a word we used. It turned out to be a clever word. If we had used, you know, frigid or uh, unsubstantial or unbending, probably wouldn't have caught on. Uh, but all the Agile Manifesto is, is a statement of values. It is not a recipe. You can't create an Agile meth methodology. You can create an environment that embraces those values and figures out how to embrace and embody them in the way that they act and they work. And then you might have um, at least something that shares with what our values were, and perhaps an Agile. So it's more like a road map. Um, not to be confused with you know, a set of things you do and then you're Agile. And this has just been growing over seven, eight years as people have been commercializing the word Agile, as people have been taking and saying, our way's Agile, no, our way's Agile. Um, 
wrong path. Um, that was, I think, called a rant. So I thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> and if, if, um, if you went out into the um, temple hall, the temple, and identified those companies that were helping the movement, because we're not, um, we're not a religion, we're not a, you know, anything. We're a movement of people who believe and share in share similar values. If you went out there, you're going to find a lot of companies that share exactly those same values. And if you went out there and find, found companies that were just trying to make money off people who believe in those values and overturned their tables and chased them out of the hall, probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Certainly be a headline. <laughs> so, so this is just a picture of Scrum. You know, Jeff Sutherland and I are the scrummers from back in 91, before some of you were born. Astonishing. And, and this is just a way to be able to do iterative incremental development uh, with some degree of transparency. And the importance for agility here is that at the end of every iteration, you have something you could potentially ship or respond to a competitive threat or those things with. And that's pretty important. Um, the thing that we're, we're looking at is this is not very well managed. People do it, and they inspect things like velocity. Um, they inspect things like defects. They inspect things like that. And they might say they're agile. But those things in themselves, you know, when I was asking you guys what an executive might consider agile, don't make you agile. All they do is give you, if you can do this really well, they give you an ability to be responsive, an ability to turn on a dime. They don't mean that you will. So what we're doing is we're enabling agility. But our managers, our executives, our CEO or CFO have to know how they can take advantage of that, how they can help their organization become the agile thing they want it to be. And I'm, my suspicion is Scrum is doing fine, XP under the covers, all that. Um, the biggest danger to them is that managers and executives, this changes their roles, don't learn how to harness them to the enterprise's agility and betterment. If they don't know how to use this, it's just going to be another fad which could be replaced by any other fad because it's what you guys do down there. So I, I, I would see that our biggest issue isn't necessarily cyclomatic complexity. I would say our biggest issue is learning, um, having management executives learn how to help their organization take advantage of this to be more competitive, to become more agile, to become more productive, and, and um, to have a better sustenance. These are, are some metrics um, that we've started looking at for agility. And these are baseline metrics. Now, what you notice is the bottom two sets, um, geez, that's, that's interesting to look at, um, value and um, de um, development quality are, are really down in the IT product development area. So they talk about how well we can build products and how quickly and how well. It talks about our stabilization time. It talks about our release cycle, how many of our customers are in the current release. Um, if I take a requirement, brand new requirement, how quickly can I get it out to a customer? It talks about basically our agility in product development, systems development. The top one talks about what is the impact of that on the organization? Because being able to do that doesn't necessarily do anything. So there we look at things like um, what are the revenues of the company? What are the cost that's being absorbed that year by the domains that build and support and service products? Then what is the ratio of that cost to the overall revenues? If you are employing software better, if you are becoming more competitive, your revenue should be growing faster than your costs. A lot of other things could enter into it. This is not a, a one standalone metric, but this is certainly something that's indicative. One of the questions I've always wondered is people get up and say, well, 
we are greatly more productive using Scrum. How more productive? Three times more productive. So you have one third of the developers. Oh no, we've actually added another 10%. What are they doing? Well, we had a backlog of stuff no one cared about, so we're doing, you know, interesting how statistics get used. So how much more money is your company making per employee that's developing product? Interesting one. Um, what is the revenue that's coming in per an employee in the organization? So the top one more talks about the agility of development and its impact on revenues. The next one talks about the overall organization's agility and able to build to bring in more money per person. And this is not by having us work double shifts. This is by us working in ways which attracts more customers, brings our products which are more, are more innovative to the marketplace better. And, and the next two, the more interesting ones, which also reflect in this is, what's our employee satisfaction? Tough to have a creative, agile organization where the, customer, where the employees are angry or don't feel empowered. What is the customer satisfaction? Pretty critical. Now, none of these are, are exclusive. None of these are, it's not a complete set, but it's a numbers that could be used to give you a sense of if I'm trying to have an agile organization, if I get a trend line on this, are we doing better or worse? Are employees more satisfied or less? Are we spending more to develop things compared to our revenues or less? So these are indicators that if you track, you start having a sense of what's going on. So just a thought. Um, and you can actually measure these across time. You know, start tracking them. Take the different areas where these metrics talk about, like employee satisfaction, stabilization time for releases, um, customers on the current release, and start tracking the way that they're changing. And if you start seeing them change in really profound ways down in the development area, we call those foundational metrics, and the others are organizational metrics. If you start seeing foundational metrics change, like velocities and things like that, but the organizational metric, metrics aren't changing, Something's off. One way of looking at it is also ways of taking all those metrics, weighing them. So like the, how quickly I can turn around a release or the stabilization time of releases, important, but maybe only one-tenth of as important as the trend in revenues per um, for the cost of development in the organization. So you weigh those different metrics, and if you take and do it somewhat cleverly, that's a word, um, you might come up with something called an agile index. And you understand how it would fit and how it works, and, and financial groups have things like this, and you could take that and you could track its improvement or its worsening across time. You could even, wow, compare it to like organizations in your industry of similar size. Be certainly be indicative. And you start doing this sort of thing and suddenly, if I'm a COO and I have read and understand that agility is important and I have drilled down on the numbers of different things that are contributing to this, I have something to do. If I see that our costs, overall costs of customer support have gone up, but we're putting out stuff faster, that's certainly something worth looking into if our development costs are you know, not following revenues. So this gives people something managers can do. I still remember I'm, I'm at Ariba, a business-to-business -business company in San Jose, we talk, and a guy gets up and he says, I'm a manager, actually a director of QA, and I don't know what my job's gonna be in this agile stuff, and until you can show me where it is, I'm out of here. This talks about what their job is. There are very important metrics about how agile they are. Not how they're operating, but their ability to be responsive, their ability to um, respond to challenges and take advantage of opportunities, that they can start trying to improve and measure and even more interestingly, compare to like organizations. I think that's called managing your business. Um, so, so this is um, an approach that we kind of twisted Scrum. You can twist anything like this. 
And we said, really neat if you want it to be more agile, that um, you always start with your metrics and see how they're doing, and then have a set of practices, um, organizational practices like compensation patterns, um, like whether you disperse parts of the organization, like how you do customer service. Um, you can take those practices and you can assess how you're doing them. Look at the ones that you think might have the biggest impact on your agility. And take a management team and give them what we might call a sprint. They'd probably call it an iteration because sprint's kind of an IT word. And give them a month to make that happen within the organization. And then look at the next most important thing that might increase their agility. You know, like no longer fixed price, fixed date contracts. Maybe we can have contracts with our customers that allow more flexibility. How do we teach our salespeople how to do that? So let's implement some of that within the next month and communicate that. So bit by bit, they're changing the organization. And as they do it, because who wants to do that for nothing, um, they can look at their agility and whether it's increasing or not. Now, that's a trailing indicator, probably by a good three to six months. You, know, you don't just change something and get better. You know, it takes a while for it to filter down. But it gives you a sense of, are you managing your company to be more agile and take advantage of that stuff that started down in the development organization? We could even take and break these um, types of efforts in, into groups. So you see we have areas of accountability. A lot of metrics, you know, not much accountability. So we've taken and we've broken it into um, enterprise accountability, how are we doing overall, value, what sort of products are we putting out, how quickly are they getting out, are they the most um, responsible products, what's their value, um, development, how are we developing our products, quality, what is the overall quality of the product in terms of the marketplace, um, and overall process of what we're doing. So we've tried to break this out into areas where you can hold people accountable. If I simply go down to um, a customer support group and say, I'm going to hold you accountable for organizational agility, they'll say, huh? But if you can like group it together and say, your, your group with this guy may be in charge, you're responsible for this and you're responsible for improving it because we want to be agile, right? And the guy can say, that's, those are lousy metrics. Say, okay, propose better ones. It would add, we'll hold you accountable for improving those because we're spending money on you and your people to improve our agility and we can measure it. God, that sounds like a management job that would be really interesting. I would like it. Um, also, you can take and look at the practices that you're implying. And we had those, again, those five what I call domains of, of agility, quality, productivity, value, the whole enterprise itself. And you can look at um, the practices in this case, we took a whole bunch of them and we maxed out what they could be if they were all implemented. And then we started looking at trends of how well they were being used throughout that organization. You can also, from this, if you compare this to the metrics, start looking for people gaming the numbers. Hmm, we can't help but notice that you haven't implemented any practices or updated practices in this area, and yet you're claiming that you are four times more agile. How do you do that? Oh, we changed what we call a five for a product backlog item to something smaller. Hmm. So gaming, you know, incent people on numbers in the game. If you look at practices and use and metrics, you can start to get a sense of whether it's real or not. Um, and these were just the domains that I talked about. And this is just a comparison that you should be able to do if you're, if, remember, we're talking about Jobs for our managers and executives who say they want to be agile, but don't, their knowledge of how to be agile is so low they're giving it to a release engineer. And we're saying, no, here are areas of practices and domains of work that make your organization more or less agile, and here are things you can imply, and here are things you can measure, and you can be looking at these just like your financial reports, your sales reports, your inventory turns, just like anything else. And you can be looking at the progress and comparing it across time. You can actually manage your way to agility. Or I think we called it earlier, earned agility. 
an approach. And, and what we've done um, is we've tried to combine the two. As you know, I kind of like Scrum. Um, so we take, and so we have this management approach, revolve around iterative incremental, delivering increments of change in the organization that become measurable. While we have the development organization, as we are now, built increments of product, of systems, that could be applied and used to make the organization agile. But without that right side going on, we could be building the most valuable stuff in the world and it's not being applied in a way that makes us more competitive. What we're trying to do is a couple of things. One, introduce the idea that agility can be measured, it can be um, qualified by the types of ways you do your work, and that it can be progressively added to your organization in a managed, intelligent, controlled way that gives you this agile advantage. It doesn't mean you're going to win. It doesn't mean you're going to be the best in the world. But it means you're making a serious effort to become more competitive and take advantage of what those guys have been talking about down in the development and product management area for the last five to 10 years. And then we actually have a synthesis. Management needs development, development needs management. We already knew that. This is a chart used by SAP. Um, truly an awesome group, 16,000 developers. Oracle has 24,000. If they stop buying people, they'll probably slow down. 16,000 people, I mean, can you imagine, hey, you're in charge of development. Here's your 16,000 people. You know, I'd have them build pyramids, but you know, that's me. <laughs> and, and they were you know, just managing them, and they were looking at um, two, two sets of numbers. One is the number of employees, which is the lower line, and the return per employee out of their sales. And, and they're tracking um, a number of things, um, like they put in a new type of software development life cycle here. And, and this is a pretty good, you know, good gap between them. And whoa, they put in another one, product innovation life cycle here. Whoops, these are starting to come together. And you're looking down around 2010, and you're watching the lines merge and shift. Not good. And this is where they started their um, XP pilots, and they migrated to um, Scrum pilots, and then they started using Scrum as a standard. And what they're watching is um, them starting to pull apart in the right direction again. So this is, you know, I said, I showed you some metrics. These are the metrics they're using to try to get a sense of, you know, how well they're doing as an organization based on those 16,000 developers <laughs> and the use of the products that they put out. And if you don't know this, <laughs> you're not managing the company. So what we're recommending in, in terms of approach is, um, if you want to create an agile organization, if your management comes up and says, oh, huh. release engineer, you're in charge of agility, you say, actually, here's an approach where you, know, you can put in some metrics and you can do this yourself, because actually I don't have any authority to do that here. Um, what you're going to build is an agile organization which is probably unlike any other anyone else has seen. You have your own culture, you have your own people, you have your own industry, you have your own products and product history, you have things which are not replicable. And so the way you look is going to be unique. And the way you go and become more agile and more competitive is going to be unique. The idea, um, as we put in our values of individuals and interactions over processes and tools of thinking you can apply a generic solution to any organization. <sighs> Einstein. Um, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Not going to work. Certainly people will spend money, people will go you know, public on Wall Street and celebrate and all that. But for those of us who care about our profession and care about helping our companies with our profession, um, doesn't 
pass the sanity test. Now, sometimes you actually don't need a lot of metrics. Um, you can assess a company's agility by looking at their products. Um, the, the product on the right, I have to give this presentation more often, um, is, a, is a self metro cell phone and um, Consumer Reports and others just tore it to shreds. Um, they said, you know, put it in your pocket as often as you can because it reboots while it's there. Um, and, and the other is the um, HTC phone and um, brilliantly developed using a lot of um, people and groups and technologies um, working together and interfacing. And I give those people for being able to pull that off at this point a pretty high agility. I mean, they pull that off, you can't be very static. So you can sort of give agility marks this way. You can also go back in history and give um, agility. I just love doing this sort of thing. Um, this is 1990, 60,000 AT&T long distance customers in New York City trying to place long distance calls couldn't get through because all the company's long distance switches, all 114 of them kept rebooting. Agility, 14 you know, out of 100. That's not a good thing. Um, the Mariner won its five-minute flight, 1962, well before some of you were born. Um, first spacecraft of NASA's Mariner program blasted off and um, started to veer off course. The guidance system blew, uh, had a few bugs in it, whatever. Failed to correct the trajectory and it blew up. In agility in building that may be a three. Certainly the product, a three. Um, the Apollo spacecraft, and I'm going to use a word a lot of you aren't familiar with. It's a bite of information. <laughs> Sometimes it has six binary bits, seven or eight, but you know, it's one small thing. And the first computer I ever used had 8,000 of them. Oh, it's just celebratory. Um, in in um, MIT, built one for Apollo 11. Um, it got the lunar module up to the moon, landed on the moon service brought, um, with the astronauts, brought them home. Um, it only had 8K in it. And um, so it wasn't even time to reboot it or the ability to reboot it. It just had to work perfectly. So I would give them like 96 in agility of being able to you know, look at all the possibilities and look at how things would work. So you, know, you can actually look at circumstances and say, huh, would I like to work in that company or not? Is that an agile company or not? What's the feel going to be when I'm working there? Are they going to take um, the value I can provide and utilize it? So, you know, we have numbers, we'll have agile um, indices, comparators, all those type things. But, you know, all you have to do is look at the company's products. And it tells the whole story. These are um, numbers that I would sure let, certainly like to have if I were a company. By the way, you see our conference title, Path to Agility. Um, I would certainly like to know if I were CEO, COO, our Agile Index at any point in time and how it's changed um, over like the last year. Significant increase, that's good. Um, I'd like to see um, the comparison of our practices we've been implementing to the metrics that support that Agile Index. Hmm, there's a skew. Someone's lying through their teeth. So minus 10, I gotta do some investigation because we're saying we're better than we are. Security Index, a number of things that have been um, reaching and work in corrupting our systems. Industry comparator, um, yeah, we're doing more agility, signatures off, but we're only two points higher than our like companies. And in our developers, this might be a little lower, um, we've been running assessments. I, I, I'll bet a lot of you don't know that IEEE has a developer assessment that's been out there for 20 years and cost 300 bucks to take and is superb. No one doesn't. So like at the entry level, what's our average score of our people? At the intermediate level, what's the average score at the professional level? What's the average score? You know, hiring criteria type thing. So what's the capability of the people who we have working on this stuff? Certainly a key aspect of agility. So Scrum, um, Agile, XP, TDD, you know, all these things, really great sets of tools, really makes us um, enjoy our work a lot more. It's not a 
gift granted from God to us. It's something that's only going to sustain and continue if the business understands it's something that's critical to them and their competitiveness and survival, learn that how to take advantage of it and how to cherish it. And as of now, very few organizations, I'll give maybe just a couple, the highest one I know is salesforce.com, um, know how to do this. And, and I would suggest that perhaps one of our bigger initiatives, certainly you know, something I'm working and focusing on over the next several years, is somehow working with these people, um, actually not myself because I'm not everywhere, but working through people who can work with these people well um, to help them understand that this is a manageable type of thing and it can take advantage of what's already going on and not being capitalized on in their organization already. That is, you're not just people doing stuff, you are um, the core of the agility of the corporation. So if we can pull this type of stuff off, if we can have them engage with us, if we can have them value us, um, two things will happen. Um, one, um, since you now have ways of measuring what's happening, the temple will empty of the money changers because they can't prove that any benefit happened. And the other thing is, um, this is going to make our profession a really, really good place to be in. Because people are going to realize the value of us doing good work rather than the competitive disadvantage of us not being um, empowered to work the very best way we can. So I think this is perhaps the most critical thing that we're um, embracing next. And it's, it's just a further instantiation of those values that um, the bunch of us came up with. I, I personally think we have the neatest um, profession, trade, craft, whatever you want to call it, um, that I've ever, I've ever run into. Um, and anything we can do to make it better for ourselves doing our work and to make people appreciate and value our work better is worth doing. So those of you who haven't taken a good look at the Agile Manifesto lately, um, you might want to just take a look at it. Because um, this, I think, is really important. We have iterative incremental, that we have iterative incremental going in development, um, that we have effort to optimize and create agility going on in the rest of the organization as a top-down management initiative. Unfortunately, they're both really important. So is this, um, for those of you that don't know, it is a, um, <coughs> a scrum, religious scrum, apparently. Um, Bart, how much more time do we have? Like, we, I babbled on for a long time. We need to start our panel. So if you have any questions, if you have any protests, if you have any um, thing to say, we're going to form a panel, and we're going to talk about anything you want to talk about, as long as we know the answers, and we think um, we can answer them in our favor. So, so. we can have, real quick, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.